Hello and welcome everyone to Pi Data Global 2021. I uh, would now like to welcome Seth Shelnut to our session. He will talk about extending Jupyter data visualizations beyond the, no the notebook. Seth is Chief Technology Officer of TileDB Inc., where he works to expand and support open source initiatives and the company's main product, TileDB. DB Cloud. Seth earned his Bachelor of Science in Statistics at the University of Florida, and he builds um, systems for ma massive data handling and manipulation. Seth is a regular contributor to open source software, and he's worked on developing a new custom storage engine for MariaDB, JupyterLab integrations, and distributed computation integrations with Spark and PrestoDB. So with that, I'll, I'll uh, turn over the screen to you, Seth. Welcome. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for the lovely introduction. And I'd like to just go ahead and thank you for all the work that you've done and everyone else has done for the Pi Data Global Conference. I know we're on the last day today and it's been a wonderful conference so far. Uh, and hopefully everyone finds my presentation today to, uh, to go along with everything that's been talked about uh, at the conference. For the presentation, I'm going to start with some slides, and then I will go into a live demo for the second half, um, talking about specifically and showing some of the visualization work that we have done here. So I'm sure Jupiter doesn't need much of an introduction for everyone here at Pi Data, um, but just a, a quick recap of, of some of the highlights of Jupiter and why we are very interested in it. Um, it's pretty much the de facto standard for interactive data exploration, analysis, and sharing. Everybody is very familiar with Jupiter. There's a lot of work uh, that data science goes on around Jupiter and a lot of development has happened in the last couple of years um, to make it very, uh, very much the standard um, for data science the community. Interactivity usually means rendering some uh, form of output in some form. Uh, one of the nice things about Jupiter is that you have a web browser and you can render things a lot nicer than on command line. So this could be as simple as tables, you know, Pandas data frame being outputted in a, a way that you can view it. Uh, rendering images, of course, maps, three-dimensional renderings, really anything's the limit, uh, sky's the limit here with what can be done. And it's important to note too that Jupyter Notebooks is extend just beyond Python. Of course, they're ubiquitous in the Python ecosystem, um, but there's kernels in many languages, R, Julia, JavaScript, and, and more. And we see the community continuing to grow uh, in the use of Jupyter, even outside of the Python ecosystem. Um, I think we've had a lot of talks uh, this past couple of days about Jupyter and the use in production. Jupyter is not just for exploration, but a lot of people take it all the way to production uses, whether this is end, uh, you know, end user dashboards or um, data exploration, machine learning models. There's tons and tons of use that people use with the Jupyter Notebooks. Um, and specifically, I'd like to even shout out the uh, Vola plugin, which can enable web-style dashboards um, to really show some of the flexibility that you have with the Jupyter environment. So to understand a little bit why we are interested in Jupyter and why the TileDB as a company has uh, invested resources, I want to spend just a, a brief moment explaining what we are, what we do, and, and where our customers really come in to see some of the advantages of Jupyter. So TileDB, first and foremost, is data stored in a universal analysis-ready format. The key foundation of this is a multidimensional array format that we have created. And this works directly with the universal data management platform that we've created around TileDB Cloud. It gives you secure governance and collaboration, scalable serverless compute, data and code sharing and monetization, enabled first and foremost with Jupyter Notebooks that we'll talk about today. Um, and our cloud SaaS service is all as a pay-as-you-go manner, specifically where the consumer is the one that pays, which works really well with the dashboard functionality we'll talk about uh, at the end of the presentation. Now, and it's important to note too that TileDB is designed to work from one user with any tool at any scale, extreme interoperability, all the way up to entire organizations. So we're very interested in Jupyter, not just for its Python ecosystem, but as I mentioned, Julia, R, JavaScript, and many other languages, because we work really hard to have extreme interoperability of the data with whatever platform and tooling that the end user is interested in. So the secret sauce is 
the multidimensional array that we mentioned. So TileDB fundamentally stores data in a multidimensional array format. This can be either dense arrays or sparse arrays. A dense is simply where every single cell has a value. Think an image uh, or a video where every single uh, pixel is going to be filled in. A sparse array is something where there could be missing values that are not materialized on disk. Think of location data where you have lat longs, but you're not covering the entire globe. Um, or think of tabular data um, with a primary key that might not have every cell filled in. Time series is a good example of that, where you often have missing values. But the foundation of all of this enables you to store any type of data in TileDB format, which directly comes to the, the place where you want to analyze any data. So how did we build all of this together and where does Jupyter fit into everything? So first and foremost, it's important to understand that TileDB works on any backend. This could be AWS S3, this could be Azure Blob Store, this could be a local file system, this could even be RAM. But we have integrations in a variety of languages and tooling. So we have seven different APIs in different languages. We have integrations with Jupyter, which we're talking about. We have integrations with MariaDB, domain-specific tools like Poodle, Joodle, Hail. Um, and pandas. And all of this is built upon our entirely embedded storage engine, which is completely open source and open spec, open format, available right on GitHub today. Provides highly parallel IO, rapid reads and writes. We'll talk a little bit about how the reads and writes come into play specifically with Jupyter. Um, it's columnar and cloud optimized, and we support data versioning and time traveling in the base format, which also will come, uh, come into play in just a moment here. On top of the embedded library, we have also built out TileDB Cloud, which is our hosted SaaS offering, which allows for the unified data management and easily scaling to global scale for access control, logging, our serverless computations around SQL, UDFs, task graphs, and of course, interactive visualizations with notebook plugins and dashboards. Of course, all of our APIs and integrations work with the embedded library and TileDB Cloud which we'll talk about in just a moment when we look at some of the R work we've done around Jupyter. So again, why is TileDB interested in Jupyter and where do we really see everything fitting together? Well, most of our users, whether they're community uh, users or customers are scaling, are storing large amounts of data in a highly scalable and highly sliceable format, TileDB. Interactive visualizations and rendering is very important for exploration and analysis. It's all great if we can store large amounts of data, but people, of course, need to access that data and do something with it. And interactive visualizations is critical for the exploration and analysis of data workloads these days. Often, data scientists also want to produce uh, some sort of report uh, or dashboard for end-user consumptions. Not everyone that will consume data is um, at the level where they are comfortable writing Python R or other uh, code. Um, and many times they're just looking for an end user style dashboard, whether that's a map rendering, whether that's just a tabular report, um, but something uh, for the end user to consume. So we've taken a lot of the lessons we've learned from the community and our customers and produced several plugins, which we'll talk about today. We have a, a large number of plugins, but I've chosen four to highlight for the talk today. The first is a content plugin where we actually store tile, uh, Jupyter Notebooks as TileDB arrays. So we talked a brief bit about the format and some of the features, and we'll talk specifically how that works with our content plugin um, in just a moment. We also have a really great plugin um, that allows you to have our shiny dashboards rendered directly in Jupyter uh, Lab and Jupyter Hub itself. Um, we've taken the Babylon JS 3D um, rendering engine um, from JavaScript and written a plugin that allows you to do some nice visualizations. We've also worked on extending the Mapbox uh, Jupyter plugin for additional mapping support and integration with uh, our, our vector tile server to have some very nice map um, renderings. So let's start off talking a little bit about the content plugin. So Jupyter provides a nice content API um, for those that aren't familiar that allows you to have pluggable backend storage. Most people just use the, uh, the file storage backend, but there's a couple of plugins that are popular out there. One for using S3 um, as a file system, uh, another one for storing your, your notebooks and Postgres. But we've specifically written a plugin that allows you to store your data in the TileDB format um, in TileDB arrays. And so we store it as a one-dimensional dense TileDB array. Um, and we inherit all the functionality of the TileDB arrays. So you can effectively store it on the remote blob store. Uh, it's cloud, cloud native, so Azure, 
uh, S3, Google Cloud, wherever you'd like to store it, it can be stored and accessed directly. No need to download that notebook. You can simply slice right from the cloud into your notebook. The time traveling support is native. So this allows you to see all revisions of a notebook. Um, this means as soon as you create the notebook, the history is saved. Uh, and every time you write to the array, TileDB has, again, it's a cloud native format. We we Every write performs an immutable write. So new writes uh, go to new directories. This allows you to time travel. And so we'll show a little bit about this uh, in the demo. But this is very powerful as you're building out your notebook and you're linking it to other users. You can guarantee that they're always going to see the right version of the notebook and allows you to go back and forth. Maybe the notebook worked yesterday. You've made some changes. It doesn't work today. We've all been in that situation. Uh, so it's very easy to go back and see exactly what your code was like yesterday. And of course, integrating into the TileDB Cloud, you get access control, auto logging, and all the collaboration features of TileDB Cloud. So the integration, of course, is available on GitHub today. Anyone can download it. You can install it. You can use it today. Um, and you can, you can start storing your arrays. We'll talk a little bit about um, how this all works in the demo, showing you some of that time traveling support um, then. The, the next plugin that we have is for R Shiny. And not everyone might be familiar with R Shiny, especially those that uh, are predominantly in the Python ecosystem, but, but R Shiny is a uh, Shiny is an R package that makes it easy to build interactive web apps um, straight from R. Uh, it's created by R Studio. Um, and it's very, very popular in the R community. Um, everyone loves to write their web apps right here. You can very simply uh, use it, much like uh, Jupyter provides a variety of um, IPy widgets and things for interactivity. R Shiny has a lot of integrations there, uh, integration with Bootstrap and, and different uh, frameworks. So you can produce very nice visualizations um, with a few lines of R code. Um, most uh, people that build Shiny apps are building specifically for data exploration or visualization. So allowing users to have an interactive web uh, interface to explore the data themselves or to do some sort of visualization. The Shiny works by running its own web server by default. So it spins up a web server and a port and people access that directly. There is a lot of overlap in the use cases around Shiny and Jupyter. Um, however, we rarely see people crossing the uh, the ecosystems between Shiny and Jupyter. And we believe uh, a lot of this is because there has not been sufficient integration between the two. You can write R uh, Shiny apps, you can write Jupyter notebooks. There hasn't been a lot of work to, to uh, link the two together um, until we've, uh, we've released some, some software now that we'll talk about to uh, facilitate that. So we built what we call the Shiny Background Manager. Um, Shiny Background Manager, or Shiny BG, is an extension to Shiny, which provides two key features that enable the collaboration. Managing multiple Shiny applications in a single process, and integration with the IR kernel for displaying Shiny uh, directly in Jupyter. Um, we really wanted to facilitate those that are in the R ecosystem to be able to explore and use Jupyter. People are very comfortable building out Shiny apps, um, so we wanted to allow those same users to be involved in the Jupyter ecosystem. As we said, the Jupyter ecosystem is continuing to grow quite drastically. And a lot of our users uh, like to program in different languages. One group might be in Python, one group might be in R, another one in Julia, all in the same uh, organization. And we wanna facilitate them having a common understanding and a common uh, uh, framework for data exploration. So once again, uh, this is available right now on GitHub. Um, we are pushing it to CRAN uh, relatively soon, but you can install it right from GitHub today. So let's talk a little bit of a deep dive into how we facilitate this because we've done quite a bit of work in order to uh, connect the dots here to allow a seamless integration between Shiny and Jupyter. The first is managing multiple Shiny applications in a single process. So Shiny typically runs on either a random port or user defined port with that web server. So every time you spin up a Shiny app, usually it grabs a random open port from the system or, or the user defines it. But the port need to be coordinated, if, uh, of course, if there's multiple Shiny apps running concurrently. And we need to keep track of you know, which app is using which port and where's the web server running so that we can use that information in Jupyter to iframe directly into the environment. So it's very important that we have the ability to manage multiple Shiny apps all in the same process. Shiny also typically is a, it blocks the main, uh, the main thread or the main process, um, much like uh, Python R's typically run in a single threaded mode, 
um, it has a similar interpreter lock like Python. So usually when you run Shiny, you're going to block. However, that's not the ideal experience for Jupyter, right? It's an inter Jupyter is an interactive uh, experience. You typically want to launch one cell and be able to move to the next one, especially with rendering in output, people kind of expect to be able to have multiple things happening. So we need to be able to launch it in the background. Also, if we're going to launch in the background, we need to be able to stop it, right? If, uh, if it's running in the background, we want to stop that notebook and, uh, um, sorry, stop that kernel and stop the Shiny app when the kernel goes down or the notebook shuts down, prevent any leakage that, that could happen. So in addition to just managing all of, the, uh, all of the Shiny apps, we also need to have integration on the rendering side of the house. So we do this via an iframe because, um, again, Jup Shiny is running its own web server. Uh, local to your, the environment, so we can simply iframe into it. Um, thankfully, the IR kernel has the ability to display raw HTML. So we're able to write a couple snippets of code uh, to pass the IR kernel, um, the HTML for iframing out whatever the, the, the Shiny server is running on. We support iframing either to Jupyter Hub or local, local Jupyter instances, so we're able to detect if a proxy is needed um, similar to a lot of uh, Python-based applications that require uh, port forwarding and proxying. All the Shiny server information is passed in directly from that manager. So again, as we're managing multiple Shiny instances, when you want to render one, uh, we have the ability to, to, we have all that information to pass directly in um, to the, the IR kernel side of the house. All right, we'll, we'll show a little bit example of the Shiny plugin and, um, when we get to the demo. Um, but I also want to briefly mention our Babylon JS plugin that we have. So Babylon JS is a real-time 3D engine using JavaScript um, for displaying 3D graphics um, in a web browser with HTML5. Um, this is currently predominantly uh, um, built by Microsoft. Um, it was not originally a Microsoft project, but they have, they are uh, predominantly the, the main users and developers of it today. And we've written a plugin that allows you to pass Python data directly to Babylon JS for 3D rendering. So this makes it very, very powerful to get data in Python, but produce those 3D visualizations that a lot of people uh, like to do these days, especially with HTML5. Full interactivity is supported. Entire scenes can be rendered and live updated uh, on the Py from, Py from Python. So if you want to render um, part of a frame, um, whatever maybe is in the viewport, and then as the user pans and zooms, add in, you know, from the Python side, fetch the new data, pass it in, and render it live. All of that is possible with the plugin that we have created. Um, we use it today predominantly for uh, LiDAR renderings, so this makes it very easy for us to take LiDAR data stored in the TileDB format and render it directly through Babylon JS for output. Most LiDAR users really like to see the rendering of what's happening. And once again, we have full interactivity around panning and zooming, which makes it very easy to slice um, parts of the data, pass it into the notebook without maybe re um, rendering the entire frame, especially if the frames, you know, uh, especially if the LiDAR data is, you know, 100 gigabytes in size, we can slice just, you know, a 10, 20 megabyte section, render it in the browser um, and dynamically update it as the user zooms around um, in the environment. Uh, once again, this is all available on GitHub um, and uh, installable today. So the last thing that I want to cover before we move to the live demo is the work that we've done around the Mapbox GL um, plugin for Jupyter. So Mapbox um, already has an existing plugin for Jupyter. It was developed for display, displaying 2D maps inside Jupyter. Um, it, but it only supports a subset of the Mapbox GL JavaScript functionality. Um, it's written very well, but we wanted to extend it to support a couple of uh, key features that we, uh, that we use with TileDB specifically, um, such as 2D vector tiles. So TileDB offers a, a native 2D vector tile server. We can store, 2D tile, we can store the, the data in uh, the TileDB format, um, and then via TileDB Cloud, we can actually serve uh, the 2D vector tiles natively. Um, so this allows anyone to render two-dimensional map data against TileDB wherever a compatible client exists. So it could be, you know, in the web browser, it could be with the Mapbox GL Jupyter plugin right here. Um, and of course, uh, Jupyter is just a very natural fit for users to map their data and to, to render those 3D maps, especially when you consider using Vola um, to render that map without needing a web server. So you can have Jupyter running in a, in a common environment, you can render the output, and with Vala, you can have that in a very, very nice dashboard form, very, very easy for anyone to, to set up without needing any infrastructure there. Um, 
Currently, most of our changes are available in a fork that we've made, but we're working to upstream it soon. We're, we're talking with the, uh, the, the Mapbox GL group and we'll be upstreaming um, some of our improvements in the near future. All right, with that, I'd like to stop my presentation and spend the, uh, the last uh, few minutes uh, showing you an actual demo of some of the, uh, the features here. So first and foremost is I want to show the content plugin that we have in Jupyter. So there's a couple important things that, uh, that I mentioned about our content plugin. And the first is that you're able to store these uh, notebooks directly on the cloud without having to have them locally. So we can see right here in the web interface, um, I'm using Jupyter Lab uh, in our hosted environment on TileDB Cloud, which makes it very simple. All the plugins are pre-installed for you and everything. But the Jupyter Lab I'm using is pretty much the Jupyter Lab that anyone uh, uh, anyone that's attended the Pi Data is familiar with, um, with all the content plugin, with all the plugins that I've just talked about pre-installed. Um, but here we can see I've got my Pi Data um, notebook already open and running, and we can see my file browser on the left-hand side. And specifically, everything's underneath this cloud folder. Um, for everything that I own underneath the TileDB organization. A typical hierarchy, similar to like GitHub style uh, uh, repositories that we use in TileDB Cloud um, for managing where all of your data is stored. Um, but if I switch to the terminal real quick, we can see that if I list, there is no cloud, um, sorry, there is a cloud folder, but there's nothing here. So we can go to TileDB Inc. and it's completely empty. This is because all of the, um, files that we see in the left-hand side are not stored locally in the notebook itself. Instead, they're all stored remotely uh, on S3 and they're accessed directly from S3. So we don't actually need to have the files in my local environment. So this is, again, super, super powerful to be able to have all of the data remotely um, and access it um, and slice and dice it right there. So this makes the collaboration very easy. Now, I also have a, a, a section here on time traveling. And as I mentioned, we have direct integration with the, the checkpoint system that Jupyter has itself. So you can use the checkpoints to go back and forth. Um, but even more powerful than the checkpoints is the fact that the data for the notebook is stored natively in TileDB with the time traveling built in. So not only in Jupyter itself can you access the data and time travel, but outside of it, you can too. So we have a, we have a nice uh, interface that we've written here in our UI to access the TileDB Cloud notebooks and to render them uh, in a static manner here, similar to how like GitHub does static rendering. And so we can view the preview and everything, but one of the, the features that I really wanna talk about is we have the, the versioning here. Currently we're in the latest version of the notebook, but if I click it, we can see all the different versions from every time that I've saved this notebook um, here. And Specifically, if we go back to, uh, to the, the 147 uh, UTC time, um, we can see that the notebook's actually changed, right? I didn't have my section on time traveling uh, quite written uh, at that point. So I've added it in the latest one. But this makes it very, very easy uh, to look at the notebook, to preview, to see what it was like before, um, to go back and forth between different versions of the notebook. And of course, you can link out to, directly to this notebook. So via TileDB Cloud again, um, we include the timestamp and the details right in the URL, so you can share this specifically with individuals uh, and know that you know they're going to see a static version of that. And if I click launch, I could actually go directly into Jupyter Lab. That would take me directly into Jupyter Lab, where we would, we, we would actually see this version of the notebook again using the checkpoint system. It's very easy in Jupyter Lab to go between different runnable versions of that notebook. So this this functionality again is all empowered by TileDB um, arrays underneath that natively support such time traveling capabilities. All right, um, if we go back to the notebook, um, one of the main things that I wanna highlight too is our R Shiny um, dashboard. And I know we're, we're starting to run low on time, so I'm gonna move through these uh, a little bit faster uh, to save room for any questions that might show up at the end. But the Shiny dashboards are one of the, the main features that we feel very, very uh, strongly about that we've added here. So of course, the Shiny is over in the R ecosystem. So I've created two separate uh, notebooks that are R notebooks um, to, to show this. The first is, uh, the, the 101 Shiny example, the most basic example you can get right from the, uh, the Shiny website um, to render the, uh, the old faithful geyser data. Um, so simply I, I import the Shiny library and I import the Shiny background library, as we mentioned. I built the Shiny app just like you normally would. So this is straight up copy paste it from the basic tutorial um, in Shiny. The main difference is I'm gonna call render the Shiny app here. And when I do that, we're gonna get the live interactive R 
shiny dashboard embed it right here. So this is full interactive, everything works. Um, and you can simply use it for any type of shiny dashboard you'd like for any complexity. Um, again, this is all proper shiny code. The only difference is the command to run it. I call the render command from, from R, which does everything we've talked about. Launches the, the shiny uh, dashboard with a particular port, um, managing all the different ports that are available on the system. It stores all that information. It then checks to see what, um, you know, what environment are you in? In this case, we are actually are running through Jupyter Hub, so it detects that it needs to use a proxy plugin and everything, uh, and then presents the iframe uh, directly here for that. So it's all managed uh, for you um, right here. Now, of course, this is a pretty basic example. You can get pretty fancy with, uh, with uh, the shiny world. So uh, we have another example where we've actually um, created the shiny app as a separate GitHub repository. Um, because this is a quite verbose application, so you can store it anywhere you'd like. Um, we simply install it in the environment using the uh, the remotes uh, installed GitHub. Um, for those that are more Python centric, this is uh, similar to a pip style install, but can install um, packages right from uh, right from GitHub. Um, next, we we once again we import the you know the shiny background. I call the library that I have, where which is already pre set up. I render the shiny app and. You can, of course, have full support for a variety of things, including if you do want to specify the port manually, a lot of flexibility there. Um, and then we have a full, uh, a full interactive uh, Shiny app here um, with you know, multiple tabs, details. We can run queries. This is actually querying a TileDB array behind the scenes, getting tabular output, um, printing um, th uh, you know, plots of the data here. So any type of Shiny dashboard uh, can be used directly in Jupyter with the plugin that we've created here. All right, going back to the Python world, the last two things that I'm going to highlight real quick is the Babylon JS plugin that we have. So I have a TileDB array that stores LiDAR data for Boulder, Colorado. Um, we're going to open the data and we're going to we're going to get the data back um, in NumPy in a NumPy uh, uh, dictionary. So I'm just going to slice a particular region of uh, this LiDAR data set that's the front of one building. I, I, I've uh, predetermined what the front of this is. Then I'm going to uh, convert the data to the dictionary that Babylon.js needs. And specifically, I'm going to colorize it by changing the, the red, green, blue to the scale that Babylon.js expects. Um, then we will create an instance of it. I will set my zoom level and render it live. And so this, again, will run, fetch the data, passes it directly into Babylon.js, and then produces the, uh, the 3D output here. It's fully interactive. You can scale. You can zoom. You can move it all around. So sky's really the limit on what you can do um, with Babylon JS. And like I say, you can also update the values with uh, however you'd like and get live updated of the rendering. So the last item is our integration with the Mapbox vector tile server. So I'm going to access a particular data set here that is the climate research unit from the United Kingdom that has worldwide temperature data for several years. Um, I'm going to have a Mapbox API that I've stored. I'm going to, of course, center this on Boston, Massachusetts, since that, that's where I'm located. I'm just going to pick a single month uh, for simplicity. That'll show some nice uh, differences on the map. Um, and then I'll just use the Mapbox um, API, calling the raster tiles, passing in a couple parameters, including zoom level. Um, and we can render it live here. And of course, you know, sky's the limit on what you can do, uh, rendering everything live uh, right in the environment. Full map is supported. Of course, all of this that we've mentioned can be used with the Vola plugin. So for instance, uh, we do have the ability to, to render the, with Vola. So here's that same R dashboard directly in the interface without any code um, with the same, the same level of interactivity that you would expect. So we have a lot, a lot of flexibility with the plugins that we've created. We're very happy to be working um, a lot on open source software and to promote uh, the Jupyter uh, ecosystem to help explore the data visualization, uh, to access the large data you store in TileDB, and have it right here in the environment um, for anyone to, uh, to access and render. Um, like I mentioned, everything that I have here is open source, available right on TileDB Cloud. Uh, we'll also provide links um, to the plugins and to the, um, uh, to the presentation um, in the chat after this call. Uh, I'm very happy to Jennifer and everyone from PyData for, for hosting us today. So thank you for the time. Thanks so much for the demo. Very interesting to see. So with that, I'll, I'll uh, stop this recording. Thanks so much for participating. Thank you.